Good morning. Well, we're halfway through the book of Ephesians. That means, well, we've got a whole lot more to enjoy in Paul's letter here to us. After two uh, chapters of explanation about what Christ has done for humanity and specifically for uh, the Gentiles, Paul switches the topic here to himself and his unique ministry to the Gentiles. Today, as we know, God calls believers to himself and then to uh, his purpose for their lives. And he wants us to respond to that call in the same faithfulness that Paul did. Turn with me if you have your Bibles with you. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read all the way till verse 13. And then I will open in a word of prayer. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, and when, this, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise of or in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. Let's open in a word of prayer here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the ministry of Paul and the good news of the gospel of grace to us. Father, we, we ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds and our attitudes here as we, as we study your word. And may we be faithful to read, to mark in and, and learn and inwardly digest all that is written here for our learning and our understanding. And that it may draw us closer to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a big question. Do you like mysteries? Maybe. Well, for those that do, what is it that fascinates us about the mystery genre? It's the journey of discovery, right? Well, no one wants to be told what the ending of a book is or the ending of a great show or movie. We want to experience that. We want to go through the journey of discovery on our own. Well, this upcoming month here, in a couple of weeks actually, uh, Laura and I have been invited to be a part of a murder mystery um, meal and uh, dinner or whatever and so I'm not sure about it yet but I'll let you know after we've uh, gone through it how it how I felt afterwards but anyway mystery in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 our passage deals here with the mystery of God's plan that Paul 
received and now shares to the Ephesians, the Gentile believers, and us here today. He's, he's doing what most people don't like in a sense. Paul is giving a spoiler-filled analyst of God's purposes in the world. What was once hidden is now revealed. As Paul begins to pray here in verse 1, he interrupts himself to, to explain his situation and testimony. And he eventually gets back on track in his prayer in verse 14. And, and we'll get there, just not today. Uh, because really, there's a lot here today and, uh, and next week as well. So it'll probably be in a couple weeks' time where we actually get to verse 14. Anyways, look with me here at verse 14. It says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. So here's where we're given some clue as to Paul's place of writing. Uh, Paul indicates here that he's a, a, he's a prisoner. Most believe this refers to Paul's two-year imprisonment in Rome, uh, spoken of in Acts chapter 28. So, we assume, we believe, he is in jail at this time. Do you remember why? It's not that he committed any moral uh, offense. So why really is Paul in jail here? Well, he tells us. He tells us that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Simply put, um, he's in jail because he has faithfully and boldly told people about Jesus Christ and the salvation that they can receive in believing, trusting in him. People don't like it. In Acts chapter 21, verses 27 to 36, you can read that on your own time. You can look it up. We see the Jews had it out for Paul, especially the Jews from Asia. They stirred up the mob, they yelled at the temple, and they, they said this, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. You see that in Acts chapter 21, verse 28. What sort of teaching did they take a offense to? Two. All right, that's a, that's a pretty good question to ask. Well, the ideas Paul produ uh, proposed back in Ephesians chapter 2, and we saw that the other week, including the truths that the person in Christ becomes new, that all believers are in one body, that the Gentiles who were far off, far away, now become near when they believe, that all believers are equal citizens of, of God's kingdom, members of the family. And that all believers are, are being built into God's temple and dwelling. We see that all unfolded from chapter 2, verses 15, all the way to the end of 22. They hated his teachings, particularly the instruction of how Christ unites Jew and Gentile into a new man and tearing down the wall of hostility. So, out of hatred for Paul, the Jews drummed up fake uh, excuse me, charges that brought a, brought a Gentile named uh, Trophimus into the temple, a violation that warranted capital punishment. Paul faced hearings from the Sanhedrin. He went before the Roman governor Felix, his successor uh, Festius, uh, and even King Agrippa, before finally it being, um, he appealed before Caesar. Um, and to Caesar he went, right? Waiting for his trial under house arrest in Rome. It was there where he wrote the letter of Ephesians that we have before us and many of the letters that we have in our scriptures. This is quite something here. The Romans arrested Paul, really, for his own safety against the mob. And, and really, this is, the only, this is only some of Paul's sufferings he endured for Christ. Paul, in verse 1, 
And Paul affirms the sovereignty of Christ who has now providentially put him in chains, brought him to Rome, and he recognizes that he himself under chains, he finds himself under chains because of his commitment to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 2 says, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. You see the irony here? The Jews falsely accuse Paul, uh, claiming that he's putting a Gentile on the same standing as Jews. And while Paul never really physically brought Trophimus into the physical temple, in all reality, Paul brought Trophimus into the true temple when he received Christ as his Savior. God had a plan about bringing Jews and Gentiles together in Christ. This is the mystery that God entrusted to Paul. And Paul explains that in verse Three, he says, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. Uh, Paul didn't ask for this assignment from, from God, but he was given a unique calling as an apostle to be commissioned by God with a specific divine responsibility. We see that in, in Scripture all over the place. We see it in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Romans chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. And over in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Give us more insight in all of this. If you turn with your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 17, Paul articulates the sense of divine compulsion behind his ministry here. And he says this in verses 16 to 17, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if, I, but if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. Paul here was proclaimed or required to proclaim the message according to God's directives alone. And as a steward, Paul would be held accountable as to how faithful he was with the truth entrusted to him. And we bring that home closer right here today. As stewards of the gospel today, how should we handle its use? I'll point out four things here, basic things. As Christians, we need to know the contents. A second Timothy chapter two, verse 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. <clears throat> Secondly, if we're handling the gospel correctly, we will believe and obey its teachings. It's impossible to be a good steward of that which you will not believe and obey. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Thirdly, we need to hold on to the doctrines found in scriptures. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 to 10 tells us that there is no other gospel. And so may our minds be renewed daily so that we can discern truth from error. And finally, if we're holding on to or handling the gospel correctly as stewards, we will share the gospel news to others. And we do this in our circles of influence, and may we proclaim it. And as we do it, may we proclaim it without fear, boldly, and in a loving way. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. Many of us know this, right? Go therefore, 
Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What a great reminder here. Stewarding the gospel is the responsibility of every Christian. If we turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, we see here Paul admonishes us in this. He's in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, by saying, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God or as good stewards of God, various very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. The question is, right? Will the Lord Jesus find you faithful on the day of his return? That's something I'm hoping and praying for. As Paul writes in Ephesians, his attention is not to simply declare the mystery, but to explain and clarify it. When the Ephesian believers and every subsequent believer would read his explanations, Paul's hope was that they would come to an understanding or understand his God-given insight into this mystery of Christ. And that's basically here what verse 4 says. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Insight means to bring together uh, comprehension, understanding. Spiritual insight must always precede practical application because what is not properly understood cannot be properly applied. Here's a, here's a humorous story to kind of give us a little bit of a break. A story was told of a gray-haired old lady, long a member of her community and church, shook hands with the minister after the service one Sunday morning. What a wonderful sermon, she told him. Just wonderful. Everything you said applies to someone I know. Oh, that's good. Uh, the opposite of spiritual insight is foolishness. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as, as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, that's not what Paul wants out of this. That's not what he's going for. He sacrificed his health, his freedom, his very life. And for him, such a sacrifice was a supreme joy to share the gospel message. Today, the gospel is an open secret. It's not hidden or be secret knowledge for only a few. Instead, the mystery of the gospel is being proclaimed to all the world. In verse 5, Paul defines the general meaning, meaning of mystery and its use in the New Testament. And, and in verse 6, he identifies the mystery he's explaining to the Ephesians. Verse 5 says, Which was not made known to the sons of men in order in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. While today the mystery of the gospel is revealed, Prior generations, well, they didn't have any access to it. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what God was up to in the world. But now the mystery that was concealed is revealed. Like all good mystery stories, the clues of Gentile inclusion were scattered throughout the Old Testament. But we only know the meaning of them because they were explained in the new. We see that in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 11 or 12. 
In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, we see God's promise to Abraham that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What was the blessing to be? Well, this wasn't known until after Paul shared in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, that really salvation was available to all by faith. In Isaiah, we're told the coming servant of the Lord will be a covenant for his people, a light for the nations, that God's salvation will reach the ends of the earth. We see that in Isaiah 49, verse 6. And again, until Paul explained this in Acts chapter 13, verses 46 to 47, those before had no idea what uh, this, no idea that this was speaking about the Messiah, bringing them together through salvation. On a side note, and for mere... uh, just uh, purpose of watching. Laura and I have been watching The the Chosen together in the evenings and uh, looking at the, putting a visual in a sense to, to the scripture, looking at how it lines up. And we notice how the Pharisees continue to be blinded by keeping the law and and missing Jesus, missing salvation, missing the unity of the body. As Jesus performs miracles and teachings in the different synagogues and cities and countrysides, it causes them fits. We see it in scripture through the gospels. They're constantly reporting, writing reports of all the rules that he's breaking, etc. Their one goal is to shut him up, lock him up, even have him arrested and later crucified. That's all entertainment, but it gives you a visual of what actually is here, already said in Scripture. I say this because the Old Testament saints had no vision of the church. The assembling together of all the saved, united into one body in which there were no racial uh, distinctions. Even after Jesus ascended to heaven, the unitedness as one body of believers surprises and it shocks Peter, one of Jesus' main believers, disciples. This is after he's seen all that Jesus has done. Acts chapter 10, Peter has a difficult time accepting that a Gentile named Cornelius could be converted and receive the same Holy Spirit as the Jewish believers. This is an apostle struggling with truth that we could be one. A good mystery is one you didn't see coming. But once the twist has been revealed, you can see and see all the evidence you didn't before. Now that Christ has come and given his Holy Spirit, God is leading us into all truth. How has his revelation revelation been revealed? Well, Paul tells us that this revelation has come to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The apostles and prophets, like the ending of chapter 2, refer to the New Testament Uh, era teaching of the gospel upon which the church is founded and not to any other persons before or after last week we saw that Christ was the cornerstone they the apostles and prophets are the foundation and we are the stones built upon it if we want insight into the mind and plan of God, we must study his word. The gospel we hold to is the gospel God has revealed. And so we must build our lives upon it. May God's word shape our hearts, transform our lives, and equip us to be faithful in teaching the truths and promises to to 
us around us and to the next generation. And as Paul did before, he can't hold on to it. This joy he shares is just bubbling up, boiling out. Now he shares how we're included in this promise. And Paul goes on to say in verse 6 that this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and, and members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is what the mystery was. To us, it seems super clear, very clear. We say, well, that's not much of a mystery. But the average Jew in, in Paul's day, this was out of the box, controversial. No one had ever seen this kind of idea before. And like I said before, this upset the religious leaders even Peter, previously only Jews were heirs. Only Jews had promises and covenants from God. Only Jews had forgiveness of sins from God. But now the Gentiles have been grafted into the body. Now they can partake or share in the promises of God. This is the mystery. And it's so, it seems so clear to us looking at it here today, but it's because it's been revealed to us. Really, there's this language of inheritance that comes to play here. Back in Ephesians 1, well, really, you need to read the whole thing, the whole chapter, but I'll just highlight some of the, the language and some of the verses here. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption, grafted us in by faith. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Verse 18, that we may know the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In Romans chapter 4, verse 13, Paul discusses how God's promise to Abram and his offspring to be the heir of the world doesn't come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The promised inheritance excuse me, the promised inheritance of the Israel comes by faith. Over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul elaborates on this image as, as a church, as a body. Verse 6 here in Ephesians is connected to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we can look at verses 12 to 13. It says this. For even as the body is one, and yet as many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For one spirit, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Isn't that amazing? In all of our differences. We talked about it last week. All the different stones. And we like to sit in our different spots. In all our differences. The gospel unites us. In a fractured society. The gospel is the glue. In an isolated world, the gospel binds. Without it, we have nothing. And the message of the gospel says that all Christians, regardless of their status or position before being saved, are now fellow partakers of everything that pertains of Christ through the gospel. Last week, we learned that we were strangers before Christ. Now we're partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ. How wonderful the mystery is of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you by, uh, for making known the mystery of Christ to us by your faithful steward, Paul. Father, I ask that we understand this great reality. 
May we be faithful and holding close to you and your word and, and obey what is in it. Father, we thank you that we can be called your child, your children, to be a member of your body by faith in your son's finished work at Calvary. Thank you that we were we are equal partakers of this unconditional promise made to Christ through Abraham and, and have become fellow inheritors with the same birthright that it is given by grace through faith to all the redeemed in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless.